so thank you. Th uh, this is a lot of fun for me. I love talking to teachers. Um, I, you know, I was trying to think, why is this an impossible task? It's a bit like talking, uh, because you're historians, it's a bit like talking about uh, the significance of Christianity in American history to the Japanese, <laughs> who may not understand you know, what the Old and New Testament is, what's the relationship between Judaism and Christianity, never heard of Constantine, may know vaguely they heard of the Ro Holy Roman Empire, Protestant Reformation, Luther, Calvin, there's all this stuff before you even get to America. You know, how, can you really talk about the pilgrims? You know, how, how do you just ju you know, jump into the pilgrims or the Mormons or the Quakers? Um, so what I want to do is just sketch in the broadest terms uh, because you can, <laughs> you know, you can go to Wikipedia, find out a lot about the six nada sex and the two hay on sex and the kamakura one practice sex. I will go into them a very little bit today, uh, but I just wanted to actually spend the first Third, uh, talking about Buddhism, just very, very general terms. Then talk about you know, how Buddhism came to Japan and, and a few little things about its impact in Japan. Because Buddhism in Japan was m very much like Christianity in, uh, in America in terms of its fundamental to its political ideology, to its culture, to, uh, uh, to social life, even when it's not acknowledged. You know, if you trace it back, you can really see how absolutely fundamental it is to the forms of polity uh, in Japan. Um, so here's Buddhism in a nutshell. Uh, in a nutshell, we have no idea where Buddhism came from. Um, uh, scholars, and by the way, just interrupt me at any time. Uh, it, it would be much easier if this is free flowing because we only have a short period of time and I would prefer to talk about what would be useful to you than go on about something that you can get from Wikipedia. Yeah. That it was acknowledged, what? It was not acknowledged, uh, Buddhism in Japan. No, what I'm saying is some people may not acknowledge the extent to which Christianity in America has been absolutely seminal to the forms of government that we have, to our ways of thinking, to our ideals. I mean, you're historians, you all know that. But in the popular mind, it's not. And in the same way, in Japan, there are many people who look at Japan today, basically a secular society and you can study Japanese history and not pay that much attention to Buddhist doctrine or Buddhist ideology, but most serious historians will say no, actually Buddhism was fundamental to the way that the Japanese understand political culture, history, uh, community, and so on. So that, that's what I meant. Um, so the, Buddhism goes back to a guy, mythological, I say he's mythological, he probably really exists, we know nothing about him. Scholars have dates that range from the 6th century BC to the 4th century BC for the life of the Buddha. So th that's 200 years. <laughs> Tells you right away we know very little about him. The earliest solid historical, it's actually epi epigraphic, uh, it, there are inscriptions on stones. The evidence that we have that Buddhism existed in India is from the reign of King Ashoka. Um, if you want me to write stuff down, or do you want me to write stuff down? Um, Thank you. Uh, uh, the reign of King Ashoka, who unified northern India roughly around 250 BC. The story is that he was a bloodthirsty uh, uh, crusader. He conquered through blood and warfare northern India, and then on the, on, on the, after the final battle, looking around at the corpses on the battlegrounds, he realized that he had done something not very great, and he converted to Buddhism and wanted to convert the kingdom or the empire to Buddhism. And he established all over India a series of pillars. Uh, these are called Inshokan pillars, and they have inscriptions on them, and they're the early evidence we have, earliest evidence we have for this. Now, if you're a uh, somewhat thoughtful uh, historian, you might say, well, there's something fundamentally cynical about Ashoka converting to Buddhism, which is a pacifist tradition that tells people to put down their arms after having conquered <laughs> Buddhism. But this alignment between Buddhism and central political power is central to Buddhism's spread, right? Ashoka is, if you know Constantine, Ashoka is Buddhism's Constantine. 
Right? He's the one who, through his conversion, now establishes uh, Buddhism as a kind of state-sanctioned um, religious tradition, and it spreads throughout Southeast Asia and eventually throughout Central Asia, eventually to China, Tibet, and Japan. Uh, who's the Buddha? This is the story. Uh, in a nutshell, the Buddha was a prince born to a, uh, the, the king and the queen of a small uh, kingdom called Magadha. Uh, near, right now, it would be what we would consider the Nepalese um, northeast Indian border. And uh, when the Buddha was born, there was an astrologer who predicted that uh, this young man would at some point become either a great political leader, uh, something that was a technical term, a Chakravartin king or a wheel-turning king that would come to bring peace throughout the world, or he would become a religious leader. It was unclear. The father was very nervous because, of course, the father doesn't want his son to go off and become some sort of religious nut. He would prefer that he took over the family business and reigned the, uh, ruled over the kingdom. And so he came up with a plan to prevent his son from uh, having any interest in what we would consider to be religion, which is he sheltered him within the palace, but provided all the pleasures possible for him. So he had the best playmates, and later on he had the best girlfriends, and later on he had the best harem, and the best food, and uh, he was a great athlete, and he excelled at everything, and he was very, very happy, and had no idea what lay beyond the palace grounds. There's wonderful descriptions about this, uh, where every time a flower began to wilt, someone would run out and clip it off, so that this young man would have no idea of, of a sort of passing, of death, of illness. No one who was ill was allowed in the palace. Uh, there's a point to this story. Um, eventually the Buddha gets, or he's not the Buddha yet, but eventually this young man, Siddhartha Gautama is his, his name, um, he uh, becomes curious about what's lying beyond the palace walls. And without his parents' permission, he convinces his charioteer to journey out. And according to some traditions, there were four trips he made out. On the first trip, he saw someone who was quite ill. The description in the text are wonderful. There's, there's boils and, and there's vomit kind of coming down and oozing blood and so on and so forth. And he goes, what on earth is that? And uh, the charioteer says, oh, that's a person who's sick. And uh, Siddhartha Gautama says, how did that happen? And he says, well, it happens to everybody. Second time he goes out, he sees someone very old. Again, very graphic descriptions of someone hunched over, barely able to walk with a cane, uh, emaciated, skeletal, hair is white. And again, the question is, what is that? That's an old person. How did it happen? It happens to everybody. Third trip out, he sees a corpse being carried. You can imagine this comes as a shock. And uh, the fourth trip out, he sees a wandering mendicant, a holy man. And he says, what is that? And the charioteer says, oh, that's someone who's trying to figure out what it's all about. And uh, Siddhartha Gautama says, great, that's, that's what I want to do. And without his parents' permission, he leaves and becomes a, a mendicant. Now, something about this, uh, this story is, is probably entirely fabricated, but it's, um, from a certain literary point of view, it's very powerful. It's, uh, if you wonder, you know, we go through the world and we're surrounded by death and old age and sickness all the time, and we generally don't question it. We don't think, like, why is this? It's just the way things are. This is an attempt to put you in the shoes of someone who is an intelligent young person, right, who's actually uh, supposed to be 29 years old when this happens, and who has never seen this before, and it goes bang. Like, why should this be this way? It's a bit like, you know, Newton's the apple dropping. And just, you know, we all take for granted. Things drop when they fall. And then somebody's suddenly asking why. Right? So the, the key point in this story is it's really, there's a kind of brilliance here. Where, where he's asking what seems to be a crazy question, which is why should it be this way? Okay, so then he goes off and he studies with um, a number of major teachers. We might call them yogic teachers, not yoga meaning like yogic postures, but um, uh, they were called shramanas. The term shramana is not cognate with a, th a shaman. 
Um, it actually just means a wandering mendicant. It was a tradition in India of the time of people going off into the forest, living a very ascetic existence, uh, in, uh, going barefoot, sometimes naked, uh, never, uh, living, uh, never, never sleeping under a, um, under a roof, uh, doing very intensive meditation practices, ascetic exercises, and so on. The Buddha didn't invent this. This was a tradition that existed in his time. He became one of those guys. And according to tradition, of course, you can see this is a very self-serving tradition, he mastered all of the teachings that were available. And he still decided that none of them had really figured it out. And so he goes off on his own. He's 35 years old. He sits down under a tree. Some wonderful stories about this. Uh, we can talk about it if you want. But uh, in a nutshell, he figures it out. Something happens to him. He is permanently and profoundly transformed. And he becomes the Buddha. And the Buddha comes from, you all know Buddha, comes from a Sanskrit or Indo-European root of Buddha, which just means awaken, just means to wake up. He's not a god, at least in the early tradition. Uh, he's not a deity. He doesn't have magical powers. He sort of does, but what we would consider magical powers, they don't. Uh, but the main thing is, is he has come to understand something fundamental about the universe. What is it that he came to understand? There's lots of, again, this tradition is like Christianity. There's hundreds of different sects, thousands of different scriptures. It's really difficult to boil it all down. But there are various different Buddhist uh, exegetical attempts to boil it all down. And one of them is the three marks, or the three characteristics. What they mean by marks or characteristics is they are fundamental to all phenomena. Everything in the universe is marked by these three things. The first is that all things are impermanent. Um, that sounds pretty pedestrian, but they really, really mean it. They mean that there is nothing that stays the same. And actually, when you get into their uh, philosophical system, they think there is nothing that stays the same even for a moment. Everything is in flux. It's a little bit akin to a contemporary <coughs> physicist's understanding of the world, which is that just everything is constantly in motion. Number two is that, therefore, there is no self. Now, what they mean by a self is uh, the Sanskrit term is an Atman. And it really is something akin to a soul. It's what we really are. In other words, there's some fundamental feeling we have that we are the same person that we were yesterday and the day before and going back to birth. Now, if we think about it, we realize there's problems with that conception. Right? We know that we've changed a lot. And yet there's some fundamental psychological sense that we have of being a somebody. Right? Somebody does something to you, and they've done it to you. Not to your body, not to your emotional states, but to you. The Buddhists are saying there can't be an Atman because there is nothing permanent. Right? Everything is impermanent. So whatever you are is a construct that is being recreated from moment to moment to moment within this flux. Okay? The third, and, and this uh, for young kids today, it's the most difficult to get their minds around. The third is that therefore there is no satisfaction to be found in the world. This is usually translated as suffering. Right? But it's simply from their point of view, the, um, the result of the fact that everything is impermanent. There's nothing you can cling to that is going to give you any sense of enduring satisfaction. The world is a painful place. That is, in other words, it's not that the world shouldn't be a painful place. That's just the reality of things. Now, by the way, the contemporary attempts, I may talk about this if we have time at the very end, the contemporary attempts to turn Buddhism into a science of happiness strike Buddhist scholars as just so wacky. It's so new agey, because actually, it's exactly the opposite. It's a tradition that says that life is suffering, and that's just the way it is. And the way to deal with it is to accept that as a fundamental premise. I mean, it's not all there is to do with it, but that is foundational. Happiness is an illusion. Okay? And yet, you go out, 99% you know, of the books on Amazon or whatever, it's all about Buddhism science of happiness, and it's the Dalai Lama smiling there, and uh, all these Buddhist monks are happy, 
and we want to be like them and so on and so forth. I mean, they are happy because they accept the fact that the world is suffering. But uh, we'll get to that in a second. So that's the three marks. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to do that. Because the Four Noble Truths are kind of really, they're much easier once you establish this as a set of meta, uh, metaphysical principles. But let me tell you, before we do the Four Noble Truths, what the Buddha did not invent, but just accepted. There are three things um, that were simply uh, part of the shamanic culture in which the Buddha gained his religious education. And those are um, that, ev that th there's a notion of karma. Karma is simply the law of cause and effect. It means action. That the actual root of the term means action. But it's simply saying that everything is the result of some prior cause. And every cause, everything that happens, will have later effects. Everything is, in some fundamental sense, determined. What makes the notion of karma um, radical or different from our notion of causation is we think of causation strictly in physical terms. We don't think of it in mentalistic terms. We're actually quite incoherent in some respects. We think that everything in the physical universe is determined by physical laws, but when it comes to my thoughts, my feelings, and so on, those are somehow just spontaneous. Those are not determined in the same way. Right? If they were strictly determined, we'd be kind of robots or zombies, which actually some contemporary philosophers of mine think we are, but we won't <laughs> get into that. Now, there are some interesting convergences between contemporary cognitive science and neuroscience and some old Buddhist beliefs, but maybe in the discussion we can get there. So um, the first one is karma, that everything, including our mental life, is in some fundamental way determined by prior causes. That was simply a, a widespread belief, although the Buddhists tweaked the notion of karma in ways that other traditions didn't. Then there's the notion that, and it's a result of that, that every birth is a rebirth. Right? There has been some prior life, that continuity, that person has died, and the inertia of their karma, just think of it as a kind of inertia, then propels a new life. Right? It's, uh, most scholars don't like to refer to it as reincarnation because reincarnation implies an Atman, that there is something, some soul that is being re reincarnated. They like to talk about rebirth. Some people say, well, rebirth sounds a lot like reincarnation. It doesn't matter what you call it, but remember that they believe that it is possible to give a robust account of rebirth without implying a soul or something that stays the same. The model for this uh, that is often used nowadays is just uh, one billiard ball hitting another billiard ball, right? You put some right scuff on it. The first uh, billiard ball just stops dead. All of the inertia is transferred into that second ball, but there's no thing you can point to that was in that first ball that's in the second. Okay, so um, karma, rebirth, and the notion of liberation that there is some goal to which the shramanas aspired that would somehow liberate them from this endless cycle of rebirth. That endless cycle of rebirth is called samsara. Samsara is a, a term with very negative valence in ancient Indian religions. It meant ceaseless suffering. It's ironic that it's now a perfume. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, it's kind of, whatever. Um, yeah. Okay, so in every Buddhist temple I've ever been in, it always has a saying that says hope is a form of suffering. And what is a form of, hope is a form of suffering? Hope is a form of yeah. suffering. And I interpreted that to mean that, that when you hope, it means you're not satisfied with what you've got, you're not in the here and now. Is that not... Yeah, what, we, what you're asking is so fundamental to Buddhism that this is where many, many Buddhist sects begin to di diverge from each other. The problem is, okay, let's do, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Let's do the Four Noble Truths and then you'll see how th this fits in. Four Noble Truths, in a nutshell, the first one is that everything is suffering. Right? The Four Noble, the three marks are thinking more metaphysically or philosophically. 
The Four Noble Truths are thinking in more practically in terms of religious practice. The first is, is everything is pretty bad, right? And you really, really have to recognize that before there's any impetus to, to change. The second is the cause of that. The cause is attachment. This is key. There, it's, it's a kind of psychological framing of this. In other words, if you weren't attached to things, there'd be no suffering. Why is being attached to thing bad? Because everything is changing. You can't grab on. It's like trying to grab on to water or air. You can't, be, you can't do it. can't be done. The third is nirvana. Nirvana means cessation, and it means the cessation of this kind of karmic impetus that is leading to rebirth and maintaining these, uh, the, the going round and round and round in samsara. So if you want to say happiness, there is a happiness, there's a goal in Buddhism, but it's utter cessation in the early tradition. Just cessation. Now, you might right away notice there's a problem there, which their notion of nirvana looks a lot like a modern atheist's notion of death. And the Buddhists back off on this later on, right? They, they really, because they're accused of being nihilists and they, they, they don't want to be. And so you will find most traditions today denying that nirvana simply means absolute extinction. But that's what it meant for the shamanas. And this notion of extinction has a very, very different um, psychological resonance if you believe that to exist is fundamentally to suffer. Right? It has a very different feel to it. Um, and then the last is the path. And I'm not going to go into that, but the path involves study and meditation and understanding and right livelihood and morality and all those good things. There was a question, there were a bunch of questions. Yeah. Yeah, go, go, go for it. Moksha, uh, so I'm trying not to use, um, uh, trying to uh, use as little Sanskrit as possible, but normally, if you're my undergraduate class and you were going to be tested, I would say one of the three ideas that the Buddha kind of takes in from the shamanas, the third liberation, the term for that is moksha. So the generic term moksha is understood specifically in Buddhism as nirvana. In other words, that's what their idea of moksha is. Moksha just means liberation. Nirvana means extinction. So the Buddhists are saying, okay, Liberation is extinction. So to get to your question, right away you see a problem. Isn't the aspiration for nirvana a kind of desire, a kind of clinging? And if you see that that's a deep problem, you get it. Right? And the Buddhists will spend the next 2,000 years working through that conundrum in very, very sophisticated ways. But, um, Time is going really fast. Um, let me just give you a, a really quick way of thinking about it that will segue into back into history and away from doctrine. And that's um, the early tradition. Well, supposedly after the Buddha died, the Buddha died when he was 80 years old. He died from eating bad pork, right? <laughs> so for, the, for your students who insist that you know, Buddhists are vegetarian, the Buddha died from eating bad pork. Uh, later on, they had trouble with that, and they said, well, he ate the bad pork because he knew it was bad. He didn't want anyone else to eat it, and then so on <laughs> and so forth. Um, but the Buddhists, they were mendicants, and they were not allowed to grow food or store food, so they ate whatever was put in their bowl. There are famous stories of lepers making uh, offerings to the Buddha, and a finger or a nose would fall off into the bowl, and the Buddhists would have to eat it. Um, that was their practice. So the early tradition, after the Buddha dies, uh, the monks get together and supposedly recite the words of the Buddha. Luckily, there was a guy who was the Buddha's cousin, Ananda, who had an amazing memory. He mem remembered everything like a tape recorder, and he was always with the Buddha, so he could authoritatively recite every word that the Buddha spoke. It's a very convenient story. And those are collected together in what are called the sutras or the scriptures. The basic, basic, it's kind of the Bible of Buddhism. If only there were one sutra. There's actually many, 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 and all the Buddhists disagree on which are authentic and so on, but whatever. There's the Buddhist sutras or the scriptures. These early scriptures 
function somewhat like the Old Testament. In other words, as Buddhism develops, new traditions will come up that will say these scriptures, they are true, they're the early teachings of the Buddha, but they're no longer relevant, or they're baby teachings, uh, we can put them aside, we don't pay attention to them, they're always there. The traditions that continue to use these early sutras are, I'm trying to figure out how to do this, this quickly. This is one where Wikipedia is gonna be wrong on and almost all the textbooks are wrong. Uh, let me do it this way. There were 18 early schools according to kind of early canonical accounts. They were just minor differences between these schools. They all accepted the sutras. Of these 18 schools, one of them, or the descendants of one of them, survive today, and they're the Theravada. The Thera uh, means elders, so it's the teachings of the elders. The Theravada teachings today are found in Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka, Laos, Burma, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, uh, those, are the, those are the primary regions where this form of Buddhism, they consider, they will say that they're authentic early Buddhism, that's not quite true. They've evolved in many different ways. It's a bit like the Protestants saying their original Buddhism, their original Christianity. But, um, they, they see themselves as holding very strictly to the earliest texts. There was another development, and this is the kind of Buddhism that it moves into China and Japan and Tibet, and that's called Mahayana, or the Great Vehicle. You can't see that. Uh, M-A-H-A-Y-A-N-A. -A -A. Maha just means big, and Yana is a vehicle, so it's a big bus. The major difference, the technical difference between Theravada and Mahayana is Theravadas want to become enlightened beings. They're called arhats. And an arhat, when you're enlightened, when you die, you're not reborn. You're ner nervanized, right? You're gone, finished. The Mahayanas say, that's awfully selfish, right? What you really should aspire to be is a Buddha. Someone who, when they become enlightened, they don't become enlightened in a world where there's Buddhism. They wait until such a time. They continue to be reborn voluntarily until such time that the Buddhist teachings have disappeared. And then they will come back and they'll reestablish the Buddhist teachings. So the Mahayanists want to become Buddhas. The Theravadas want to become Arhats. Mahayana becomes the dominant school in Tibet, China, Korea, Japan. So by definition, all, all traditions of Buddhism in Japan are Mahayana. This distinction, it's not really analogous to the Catholics and Protestants, but it's as big and it's as uh, conflicted as the distinction between the Protestants and the Catholics or the Sunnis and the, and the, the Shiites and so on. Yes? What's the difference between Arhat and a Bodhisattva? A, uh, a Bodhisattva means a being destined to become awakened. Bodhi, it's the same root as Buddha. The Buddha, before he was born, was a Bodhisattva. So Theravadas believe that there are Bodhisattvas, and in fact, there are many around because all the future Buddhas are Bodhisattvas. But that doesn't mean that we're Bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas are really, really, really special beings, unbelievably special. They forego their own enlightenment for eons in order to become Buddhas one day. The Mahayanists say, no, the real teaching of Buddha is for all of us to become bodhisattvas. So actually in early Mahayana scriptures, they start writing their own scriptures, they just make it up. And they all, they, they, they couch them as if they were written by the Buddha. It's really quite bold. Um, they're fascinating uh, texts. But um, they would say, that the bodhisattva is simply a term for a, a, someone who aspires to be a Mahayana practitioner. So this is a complicated term. Now to make it more complicated, scholars will talk about two kinds of bodhisattvas. Celestial bodhisattvas and just kind of you or I bodhisattvas, right? I don't know what the other, this is a, this is a Western made up term. 
celestial bodhisattvas are certain beings that have rotated through samsara for so long that they have unbelievable powers. They're really virtually godlike to us. So when you go into temples, Mahayana temples, only Mahayana temples, in China, Japan, right, which means all temples in China and Japan, many of the images that you see, which are not Buddhas, you can tell Buddhas, they have the little tight curls. It was a late early, late 19th, early 20th century theory that the Buddha was actually black because of his hair style. Take a look at it, it's very strange. Um, and so on, there's a bunch of marks of the Buddha. But if they don't look like that, if they have crowns and multiple arms and many heads and so on, they are what we are calling celestial bodhisattvas. They are like saints. They function exactly in medieval Christianity as saints did. Uh, in other words, they're go-betweens. Why do you need a bodhisattva go-between? Because Buddhas are nirvanized. Buddhas aren't around anymore. So if you want to pray to somebody, if you want help from a superior being, you can't go to a Buddha. You've got to go to a bodhisattva because they're still around. Right? So that's when you go into Japanese temples. There are images of the Buddha in, in Japanese temples. And there was in Mahayana later on a theory that Buddhas are still around. Again, they muck with all of this. But very fundamentally, it really becomes a cult of saints, bodhisattvas, who you can call upon for assistance. Yeah? Theravadas want to become arhats, arhats, and be gone. And be gone. And, uh, but, but I'll give you a, and the exception, for example. The next Buddha, according to the Theravada, according to the whole early tree, actually, Mahayanas agree with this. The next Buddha is a guy named Maitreya. Right? Maitreya's, Maitreya, therefore, is a bodhisattva. He must be around somewhere right now. He's going to come in a, a many eons from now. Eons, the, the time scale in Buddhist cosmology is unimaginable. You want to know what the time scale is? <laughs> Here's one, one of them. Uh, it's measured in kalpas. So we just translate that as eons. But a kalpa is, imagine a block of granite, seven yojanas by seven yojanas by seven yojanas. How long is a yojana? A yojana is the distance that an ox cart can travel during the summer in Benares. So we calculate. <laughs> it's, it's, if you think of it as 10 miles or so, then you've got a 70 by 70 by 70 mile of, a block of granite. Every 100 years, a bird flies by with a fine piece of Benares silk in its mouth. The Benares silk grazes the top of the granite once every 100 years. The amount of time it will take for that block to wear down is one kalpa. Right. So when they, talk, they, they love this stuff. But it's, you know, it's not crazy. It's like going to a planetarium today, and they're just trying to blow your mind with, with, with the kind of distances involved and the billions, like the unimaginable size of the universe. The Buddhists were doing exactly the same thing. They were just trying to blow your mind with the kind of distances and time and space involved. So when they say, you know, Maitreya is going to come in 100 kalpas, that's a very long time. But he must be somewhere right now. And there is, actually, in some Theravada countries, you do have a kind of cult around Maitreya. And scholars argue whether or not it's actually influenced by Mahayana. I forget your question already, so I don't even know if I answered it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm having a, yes, it's fine. OK, <laughs> yeah. But that's Theravada. That bodhisattva has to acquire a certain set of, we could call it, you know, it's like a PhD instead of a BA. Uh, it's an additional set of requirements that will take additional kalpas to acquire. The, the term for that is a paramitas, just they're perfections. They're called the six perfections or the ten perfections. And that's what bodhisattvas are cultivating as opposed to what Theravadins are cultivating. So one example of a paramita is compassion. Compassion is important in Theravada, but it's not the primary focus of your practice. In Mahayana Buddhism, compassion becomes much more important because compassion is 
selflessness. Now, here's where we get back to the question of the, de the point of desire in all of this, which, which I know we're never going to get to Japan. But anyways, um, <laughs> if you think about the early tradition, uh, what is their response to saying, isn't meditating really hard with the aspiration of attaining nirvana? Isn't that a kind of desire? The early tradition, in the view of some scholars, doesn't have a really sophisticated response to that. The response is, well, yes, that is sort of true, but don't worry about it because it will take care of itself in time. The desire to attain nirvana is a kind of good desire. They don't really come out and say that because they realize it's, it's a problem saying that, but they sort of gesture in that direction. They basically say, don't worry about it. And then they come up with a bunch of metaphors. The metaphors of the Buddha, of uh, a person coming to a river, he wants to cross the river. He builds a raft to cross the river. When he crosses the river, this is a very famous sermon called the Raft Sermon, the Buddha then says to the monks, well, what do you think? When he crosses the river, does he then continue on his way carrying the raft on his back? And the monks say, no, that would be stupid. It says, in the same way, once you've crossed the river, you can put down my teachings. Right? It's simply a device to get you somewhere. So that's how they handle this question of desire. Desire is like the raft, but at the right time, you will put it down. The Mahayanists think that's crap, right? <laughs> it's just, it's, fun, it's cheating. And so what they do, one way to understand this whole emphasis on the bodhisattva is a bodhisattva is someone who actually gives up their own enlightenment. Instead of aspiring to become enlightened themselves, they redirect that energy to acquiring the kind of tools it is involved in enlightening others. So the whole emphasis on, on Mahayana is actually not on attaining Buddhahood. That's still technically the goal, but it's on living the life of a bodhisattva who is selflessly trying to help others. Right? That gets into a notion that really, since there is no self, if you are simply acting to help others, you're actually instantiating your own selflessness. And this gets into a doctrine of inherent Buddha nature, which if you read anything about Japanese Buddhism, you're going to hear a lot about. You can see the seeds of it in this notion of the bodhisattva, in renouncing any desire for your own liberation, in effect, is instantiating or becoming, coming to terms with your own essential liberated nature. But that gets into all sorts of philosophical stuff. We don't have time for it. Yeah. Yes. Me? Yes, you. you. Um, so going to Japanese Buddhism. Yes. Uh, worth it. Um, yeah. How does the um, Shintoism um, kind of align with Buddhism? And, and it, I, I read somewhere that it kind of almost got integrated within, almost the same way that you have some of the um, okay. Native African religions getting integrated with Catholicism, and you, and, and you talked about saints. Okay, so let's jump. I was going to talk about how Buddhism gets from India to Japan. I won't. Let's just jump right to Japan. Okay, it actually goes into China, and all sorts of things happen in China, and that's a big problem. Which is the Buddhism that comes into Japan is not the Buddhism from India. It's the Buddhism that had already evolved for like 500 years in China. So it's its own thing. But when we get to Japan, how do we understand what existed prior to the arrival of Buddhism? Now. There is one paper that I gave you called, in, uh, uh, I didn't give you the paper, I gave you a bibliography. It is a really absolutely fundamental piece of the puzzle here. And it's um, Kuroda Toshio, Shinto in the History of Japanese Religion. Now, this is where pragmatically how much you as middle school history teachers want to swim upstream, I'm not sure. But in other words, everything you read will say Shinto is the traditional religion of Japan. It was what was there before Buddhism was there. It has something to do with nature worship and the kami, uh, the spirits that, pot, you know, that, that are in nature and little stones and trees and so on and so forth. Uh, Kuroda Koshi Toshio says, in a nutshell, that's all bull. Right? Um, there was, no, there, if you want to refer to uh, pre-Buddhist religion in Japan, 
uh, it is perfectly appropriate to talk about kami worship, the worship of individual spirits, many of which were indeed located in the geography, sacred mountains, sacred trees, and so on. That was happening. The question is, when did these different local cults begin to see themselves as localized version, versions of some larger tradition called Shinto? Late 19th century. Uh, late 19th century, after the Meiji, or, or it's actually leading up to, it's part of what's, uh, how, historically, how far is this course or seminar supposed to take you? Is it mostly medieval? Yeah. Yeah. So you're not going to get to the Meiji Restoration and so on. But in a, in a nutshell, this is a time when Japan wanted to reassert their national or cultural identity. And they do that by rejecting everything is foreign, everything that is foreign. This was precisely the time, of course, when they opened up to foreign powers, and that was why it became so essential that they hold on, they decide they had to identify what makes us Japanese. This is, yeah, th this is, well, 1868 is um, the, uh, the Meiji Restoration, wait, 1868? Uh, thank you. Uh, Meiji Restoration. In the 1870s, they begin to persecute, really quite dramatically, Buddhism. They begin to see Buddhism as the source of their benighted, backward thinking, right? They get very interested in Western science and so on. And they want to say, Buddhism has occluded our innate spirituality. Our innate spirituality is this thing they call Shinto, right? Shinto, the giveaway is that Shinto is a Chinese term. It's not even an indigenous Japanese term, right? They're using the onyomi instead of the kunyomi. I won't go into that. Um, but uh, Kuroda Toshio is going to unpack that whole thing. Why do we think that Shinto is nature worship? Kuroda's argument, and it's been accepted by most scholars that I know, is that because they want to divest themselves of everything continental, continental means the Chinese continent and Korea, they want to do, then they have to strip out all of the metaphysics, the philosophy, the path, the, all the stuff that was simply part of Japanese culture. Anything identifiably Chinese or Buddhist had to go. What are you left with? Nothing. <laughs> and so you end up with this religion that has no ideology, no history. It's just this vague sense that nature is beautiful and let's worship it and presto, you get our modern, very romantic conception of Shinto, right? Again, it's not saying that there were not local cults all over Japan that go way, way back, but those local cults didn't imagine themselves as being individual instances of some larger conglomerate called Shinto that had some kind of national identity to it. So that, in a nutshell, is the answer to that. And I am in Japan now, I think, yeah. Right, so, so it's a, con again, uh, it, it, see, I'm in Japan, but now I'm in the 19th century, so it's not helping. Uh, <laughs> but again, very quickly there, you could say, well, what are the elements of Shinto? So what they say is Shinto needs a sacred text, right? If it's, a official, if it's an official religion, like Christianity is the religion of the West, and Buddhism is the religion of China, they need scripture. So they come up with a scripture, the Kojiki. Right. Are, are you de talking at all about the Kojiki in here? I'll so, talk about it tomorrow. Okay. So the, the Kojiki is this text. Now, the Kojiki was not, you know, and it becomes like the Bible of Shinto. So now if you want to do a course on Shinto, you start with the Kojiki. But the Kojiki was like a family record of the, of the imperial line that was associated with a particular imperial temple called Issei, which, you know, still a very, very important temple in Japan. That, so what they pick as being essential to this new conception of what Japanese religion is, is a particular, um, uh, you know, is a temple and a set of texts which were associated with the imperial line. Why do you do that? This is the Meiji Restoration. They're trying to turn the emperor into a new kind of deity. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff you have to unpack to answer uh, that kind of question. And again, I think it would give us two, but Kuro Toshio's article is, is, is great for that. Yeah. So you think of whatever Shinto was actually when Buddhism arrived as 
any kind of animistic religion that, that sure. you would find in any sure. pre monotheistic or pre Yes. And there are scholars who work very hard to, to, to tease what that is out. Remember, Japan didn't have any writings. That, we're talking prehistory. Pre-Buddhism is prehistory, in a sense, because writing comes in with sustained contact with the continental mainland. So it's coming in with Buddhism as, as kind of a package. So everything from the get-go is already, it's, it's already jimmied, in a way. Um, when they do try to get back behind that, what most critical scholars see is not indigenous Japan, but is Korea, right? And you probably are, are dealing with, with some of that, because at least on the syllabus. In other words, uh, the imperial line, there are many people who believe that the imperial line is actually an aristocratic Korean family. This is anathema in Japan, right? This is as heretical as you could get, because it's supposed to go back to the sun god, it's native Japan, it's all tied in with the specialness of Japan. But there's some very interesting evidence from the early Kofun, these, these imperial graves, that there's so much about them that looks Korean, right? So there may have been an earlier wave of Korean, powerful co Korean, well, we, we call them aristocrats because that's what they were in Japan. We don't know who they were. But they're bringing in an earlier uh, wave of culture. So it's really different. So if, you're, if your understanding of religion is, well, everyone was animistic at one point, that will do you fine. But it doesn't actually tell you that much on the ground. Yeah. You mentioned earlier in the lecture that um, Buddhism in Japan affected everything in Japan the way Christianity in America. Yes. OK, so now, yes, in the last five minutes, I'll try to get to that. So um, Buddhism comes in uh, in a major way in the Nada period. Uh, I'm not going to write the dates down. You, you probably have those already. The Nada period, they talk about the six, yes, the six um, sects. This is kind of standard uh, history writing. Um, don't think of Buddhism coming into Japan in the Nada period. It's not Buddhism the way we think of it today. They are aristocratic families, like the Fujiwara family we were talking about earlier, bringing in powerful Chinese Buddhist priests to do rituals for their own family or clan purposes. You know, whether it's to cure sickness or foresee the future or all sorts of other stuff that Buddhist priests did. Now, how do we get from like nirvana to curing sickness and so on? That's what I had to skip. That's, that's a thousand years or so. But uh, <laughs> Buddhism is a religion like all religion. The priests were priests, and they did various different priestly functions. Much of it had to do with death. It revolved around sickness and death. So if you were a powerful family in the Nada period, and you could afford to send a mission over and bring back a few powerful priests from the continent to perform services for your family, you'd really made it. And then you set up a shrine in your home. So these, these major temples that we see today, Kofuji, just started out as a shrine. Kofuji is a massive temple complex in, in Nara. Started out as a little shrine, a Fujiwara clan shrine. It wasn't meant for anybody to walk into. It was quite the opposite. Um, so we start out with these clan shrines. One of the shrines was an imperial shrine. It was associated with the imperial family. That's Todaiji in, in um, Nara. So all of these were very imperial or aristocratic as associated. They, it was not a religion for the common people. In the Heian period, they talk about two major sects coming in. One is the Shingon. Uh, again, I can slow down and, and go into this in detail. I'll just give you an overview, and then you can uh, tell me what you want me to expand on. But there are two sects that came in, Shingon and Tendai. You see that? S-H-I-N-G-O-N and T-E-N-D-A-I. You can get this, again, this is Wikipedia, standard stuff. Heian, two sects, Tendai and Shingon. What's important about them is that one of them, Shingon, the guy came back was Kukai, and for reasons that are still a little bit befuddling, he became very, very powerful in Japan. The particular form of Buddhism that he studied in China for a remarkably short period of time is what we would consider to be tantric, tantric Buddhism. This was a form of Buddhism that represented a very late stage. We're now, you know, we're talking five, six hundreds. A very late stage in the evolution of Indian Buddhism. 
when Indian Buddhism had begun to incorporate a lot of non-Buddhist Indian ritual traditions. Traditions that actually go back to the Vedas. Fire sacrifice, for example. Has anybody been to Japan? Um, yeah. So if, if you go to temples, some of the old temples in Nara, once a month, many of them will still perform a fire ceremony. It's fantastic if you're a historian of religion, because this goes back way, way, way pre-Buddhist to Vedic uh, altar sacrifices. But this stuff comes into Buddhism, and these guys, what makes Tantra Tantra in a, um, in a formal sense is that Buddhism, what, what the Tantrics say, is regular Buddhism deals with otherworldly goals. Goals like nirvana and becoming a Buddha and freeing people from suffering. Non-Buddhist religious traditions deal with worldly goals. Um, you know, getting over sickness, finding a wife, uh, being fertile, having children, um, avoiding death, uh, killing your enemies. Uh, there's all sorts of, of things that worldly purposes to which you, know, you, go, you go to a priest. What Tantra does is it brings the two together. And it brings the two together because of a very sophisticated philosophical move that says that this world is the Buddha land. We're all already enlightened, we just don't know it. And that the point is to, in, in these very elaborate rituals, to somehow demonstrate, um, or what, what the rituals actually do is they call on the forces of nature to transform things, to both transform our own understanding of things and also to make people heal and to defeat enemies. They did a lot of defeating of enemies. So tantric Buddhism becomes a very important model for what Buddhism is in the Heian period. During this time, it is still primarily an aristocratic cult. You went out to the countryside or to anybody, you know, down from the aristocrats, they were not, you know, they didn't have money to hire a Buddhist priest to do anything. There were not big Buddhist temples that you could walk into and perform kind of private uh, devotion or worship. Uh, you were still locked in with your, your individual kamis. The Kamakura period, all this breaks open, and you have three major traditions come out of it. Pure Land, Zen, and Nichiren. Kamakura period. And I'll let the historians talk about what kind of social transformations uh, led to this. But what's key about these three traditions, the Pure Land, they're actually, if you want to get technical, there are two major Pure Land traditions, the Jodo Shu and the Jodo Shinshu. Do you go into that kind of detail at all in here? You can forget about it. Pure Land, <laughs> Pure Land Buddhists, in a nutshell, they believe uh, there is a, um, it is true in early Buddhism that the next Buddha is Maitreya and that Maitreya is going to happen like eons from now. So there is no Buddha around right now. The Pure Land tradition, which is actually an old, in, it's an Indian tradition, gets transmitted to China, gets transmitted to Japan and really reworked in Japan. But in a nutshell, they believe that is true. There is no Buddha here, but that doesn't mean on some other planet somewhere, they would call it a world system, there isn't a Buddha right now. And in fact, there is a Buddha right now. His name is Amida. And he's a very powerful Buddha. He's so powerful that all you have to do is recite his name. And when you die, he will come down and take you to his Pure Land. Right? That's, Pure Land uh, that, that's Pure Land for kindergartners. It's actually a very sophisticated tradition. But it's actually also, that's true. They really do believe there's an Amida Buddha. And you just recite his name and you'll be right. Then there's Zen. I can talk about Zen in a minute. And Nichiren. Now, what's important about these three movements is they were all started by individual charismatic leaders who were all trained in the Tendai tradition in this kind of tantric Buddhism. So in the same way that Protestantism takes on a particular importance in America that it never had in continental Europe, or arguably didn't have. I'm not a historian. Let me get away with that. Uh, in the same way that Tantric Buddhism, which was a very, very minor, small development in China, becomes fundamental in Japan because all of the founders of the Pure Land Movement, the Zen Movement, and the Nichiren Movement all trained in this kind of Tantric Buddhism as it was um, 
taught within the Tendai school. It was one particular monastery on Hiezan. You don't need to know. Hiezan in, uh, in Kyoto. Right? They all trained in the same place. And then they all went out and they said, what we really want to be doing, we don't want to be doing these, we don't want to work for the aristocrats anymore. We want to bring our teachings to the masses. And that's when Buddhism, it's in the Kamakura period, Buddhism became, it just covered the countryside. And how this happened, lots and lots has been written on. Um, but to, to, to this day, by far the largest traditions in Japan, or Pure Land and Nichiren are really the largest. Zen is also quite large. The six Nada sects almost don't exist anymore. There's about 10 monks in one sect, Kofuji, Hoso, um, and so on. So you get like everywhere from 10 monks to three monks or two monks for the Nada sects to um, you know, tens of thousands for uh, Tendai and Shingon to hundreds of thousands for Pure Land Zen and Nichiren. Maybe, you know, having just sketched that out. Um, so you've got about 12 minutes. Oh, where do you want me to go here? Now, I, I mean, I can spend more time talking about what's going on in the Heian period with Tantric Buddhism. I can spend more time in Kamakura period. We could talk a little bit about what these sects are about. We could talk about what they are today. Yeah. Okay, medieval. Yeah. Okay, so Zen. Uh, Zen for kindergartens, uh, kindergartners. Zen, uh, and it's really important because that's the one, you know, if your students have heard of anything, I assume they'll have heard of Zen. Uh, Zen is actually a contraction of a two character compound called Zenna, um, which uh, I, I won't give you the Chinese, but it goes, it, it's really just a transliteration. It's not a translation. The characters don't mean anything. It's a transliteration of a Sanskrit term, dhyana, which means meditation. So this is the meditation school of, of Japan. Now, all of these are called one practice movements. Every one of them took the incredibly sophisticated ritual and scholastic and exegetical and scriptural apparatus of Buddhism and said, you don't need that. You don't need it. All you need to do is this single, simple practice. In Pure Land, the simple practice is recite the name of Amitabha. Namu Amida Butsu. It just means Hail Amida Buddha. Right? That's all you need to do. In fact, this movement, it's, it's really fantastic because it's very um, Calvinist. They believe that if you recite the term twice, or actually sometimes they'll say 10 times is what it takes to become liberated, right? If you recite it more than that and think that it's doing you any good, you don't get it. You don't have faith, right? Because you, if to have faith means you do it 10 times and that's it. Now, why do you continue to chant after that? Out of gratitude, right? Because your gratitude for Amitabha for having saved you, right? Now, Again, this looks like kindergarten stuff. It's really sophisticated. Go back to your original question on desire. They're saying, give up all desire. There's nothing you have to do. You're already there. You're saved. Now go out and save other people. All right? So it's, it's actually quite neat. The Zen people, they said, all you have to do is sit. Take this posture and sit there. There's two versions of Zen. There's Soto Zen. Uh, and again, you don't need this, but it's to g really give you the one practice thing I have to do. It. Soto says, just sit there, and you don't have to do anything else. If, if you really look at what Soto are telling you to do, they mean it literally, just sit there. Because when you sit there, you assume you manifest your identity as a Buddha. If you're trying to do something, if you're trying to get enlightened while you're meditating, you don't get it. Right? Just sit there, don't move. Which, which sounds, again, sounds really, try it, right? <laughs> it's really, really, really hard. Um, the, the Rinzai people, they said, just sit there, R-I-N-Z-A-I. -I. They said, just sit there and contemplate the words of the patriarchs. The words of the patriarchs are koans, which you've probably heard of, these kind of uh, very short utterances. And they said, just contemplate those because then you become one with the mind of the patriarchs. The Nichiren people, they, um, there's, 
there were many, many, many hundreds of Mahayana scriptures. It, it uh, drives people nuts. The Nichiren was, a, uh, again, a charismatic founder, really a nut. Um, he was very anti-government in Japan. He was banished. He had a lot of trouble. But he said, the only teaching of the Buddha that we should pay attention to is the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra is very long, but it is so powerful that you don't have to read it. All you have to do is recite the title of the Lotus Sutra, which has within it all of the bountiful good effects of having understood the Lotus Sutra. Right? So they're the ones, they just recite the title, uh, nam myoho renge kyo they give rise to a, a cult, contemporary cult, called the um, Soka Gakkai, that is actually the one tradition in America that has become very uh, popular among African Americans. So, yeah, you're trying to get me back to the medieval period. No, no, I have a good question. Okay. <laughs> You mean in the masses? If you had to look at like the, uh, the social structures in terms right. of like who's up, who's down, who's adopting what. I get it. So in general, Pure Land and Nichiren tend to be lower class. They really, they go out into the countryside. When the migrant workers first came to America, the first tradition that sent missionaries, the first um, Japanese Buddhist institution to send missionaries to cater to the Japanese uh, workers in America, they were all Pure Land. If anybody's heard of the Buddhist Churches of America, they're, they're all Pure Land. And, um, and it, it tells you something that they were, in a, they were really down on the ground. Zen, Soto Zen, uh, made some inroads. Actually, they became very important in the populace. Rinzai Zen tended to stay in the capital. It was the one of these Kamakura sects that maintained very close aristocratic ties. It actually had to do with the fact that in the Zen tradition, for various reasons, they kept going back. The, the Pure Land people, they could care less about what was going on in China. The Nichiren people, they made it up. They, there was nothing going on in China that was going to help them. The Zen people, just because of the nature of their tradition, they wanted to maintain very close ties to the Zen tradition in China. Because at this point, Kamakura period, Zen in China is the dominant Buddhist tradition. So unlike Pure Land and Nichiren, uh, this Dhyana tradition really did come from China. So if you were a member of, of the elite, if you were a samurai, for example, you needed training um, in certain uh, continental arts. They're continental arts like calligraphy, poetry, uh, just reading and writing, um, and so on, in, in Kambun, or reading Chinese texts. The place you went to get that was often a Rinzai Zen monastery, because these were centers not only of Buddhism, but also of Chinese learning, Chinese culture. This leads to a mistake in the contemporary period that the Chinese arts, for example, landscape gardening, dry landscape gardening, calligraphy, painting, particularly uh, monochrome landscape painting, uh, what else, tea ceremony, that all this stuff has something to do with Zen. It does have something to do with Zen in that you went to a Zen monastery to get this training earlier on. But when you did it, no one in medieval times thought that you were getting training in Zen. You want to know why we changed? <laughs> in a nutshell, uh, whether you want to or not, but this is something I find really fascinating. In the 1870s, remember we talked about there was a persecution uh, of Buddhism. 1868, uh, Meiji Restoration, then you, uh, they wanted to push Buddhism out of the way. Certain people, particularly a guy whose name you may know, um, but he was not the only one, but, D.T. Suzuki. DT, has anybody heard of D.T. Suzuki? Very important in this country, in bringing Zen to this country. Right? So when you hear of the Beat Generation, Jack Kerouac, uh, Gary Snyder, and so on, they all studied with D.T. Suzuki. D.T. Suzuki was an intellectual. He was not a Zen priest um, or anything. He was an intellectual, but a defender of Buddhism. And these people said, no, Buddhism is not foreign to Japan. Buddhism is the very source, but what they really meant is Zen, 
Zen is the very source of spirituality in Japan. And it permeates every aspect of Japanese culture. It permeates landscape gardening and architecture and aesthetics and, and painting and calligraphy and so on. It was an apologetic, a, 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 an attempt to reestablish the authority of Buddhism so that it wasn't wrapped up in this notion of otherness. Right? And that's where we have you know, this crazy notion that the martial arts are all Buddhist. Right? This was an invention of, of the uh, late 19th century. All right, so. Okay, we have yeah. about three minutes. So. Okay. Two questions. Uh, I understand that you are indeed loved in Buddhism, but if you try to be objective, which religion uh, most strongly impacts uh, Japan, Confucianism or Buddhism? So, um, Uh, I, you know, that's a whole other lecture. Confucianism, <laughs> Confucianism is a bit of a made-up tradition in the same as Shinto is a made-up tradition. Confucianism is invented, the way we think of it, it was invented in the Song period in China as a response to the, the success of Buddhism. That doesn't mean that the texts of Confucius were made up. They go way back, and commentaries on Confucius go way back but it was never anything like a religion. In the Song Dynasty, this is Kamakura period, but in, it, it's uh, analogous to the Kamakura period. Um, they invented this thing called what we now call Neo-Confucianism. And uh, it said, oh, well, actually, Confucianism was not only a political ideology, but it was actually a spiritual path, and, and so on and so forth. That is brought in by the shogunate. They find this very appealing because of its kind of top-down, very hierarchical, everybody behave, it's all about social harmony and so on. Buddhism is much more individualistic in many respects. So the, the, the shogunate bring in a lot of these so-called Confucian values. They are Chinese values. They do go way back. But most scholars uh, would not consider Confucianism, they would consider it a kind of ideology um, a, uh, maybe a political ideology or a, a, a social philosophy. But the idea that Confucianism is a religion was something, again, made up in a way. So you could certainly say by the Tokugawa period, what you have is Buddhism, Neo-Confucianism, you know, Neo all sorts of things joining together. Now, a lot has been said about Confucianism in Japan, which again is kind of hooey. You, you remember in the, you know, in the, the uh, 1980s, when Japan was suddenly this incredible, you know, dynamic economic power, and everybody said, how do they do it? It's because they're Confucian, and they all believe in harmony and working for the greater good, the collective good, and so on and so forth. That kind of ideology is found in Japan, but you only, can, you only propound an ideology like that if there's a natural tendency not to go in that direction, right? The, the Japanese, you know, left to their own devices are just as individualistic as anybody else, right? So the notion that they're somehow more innately cohesive because they have wet rice agriculture, I don't know if you've read any of this stuff, but it's this notion that they have wet rice agriculture and they grow up in small villages and they have to, it forces them, because of the irrigation involved in rice agriculture, it forces individual farmers to work in collectives in ways that other kinds of agriculture doesn't force them to work in. There's all these stories that were made up to explain why the Japanese are just somehow more harmonious and cohesive. And many scholars, to, I'll, I'll leave it up to the historians, but many historians would say, well, this was just part of you know, 20th century Japanese propaganda. Right? The, the, they were trying to create a war machine and in creating a war machine, they had to enforce a kind of collective, uh, a sense of collectivity. And they, of course, they picked up on some of the same elements that the shogunate was using, the so-called Neo-Confucianism and so on. But that, that I, I look at that as somehow dross. That's kind of official ideology. Buddhism was what really impacted people's lives through much of the period. The particular notions of divine forces, and again, we can't talk about it, but it comes in with Tantra these divine forces that permeate the world and how you can manipulate those divine forces and, and what life is about and what death is about. These kind of very deep felt metaphysical commitments that we have are much more Buddhist, I would say, than Confucian. That was a long answer, sorry. Yeah. My textbook puts forward that uh, the charismatic leaders and kind of the spread of Buddhism to the masses was encouraged by the 
encouraged by the elites to break or to weaken the uh, strength of the commies and, or no, pardon me, to weaken the local clan leaders because the people viewed, uh, viewed them through the, as a, a way towards the commies, does that make sense? Um, the individual clan leaders were used as yes. Uh, in a nutshell, this is not my specialty. This is where it would be better to go to one of the historians. Now, I don't know what period you're talking about. In, in the Tokugawa period, which again, too late for you guys, but in the Tokugawa period, this becomes explicit. Every single family in Japan has to register with an official Buddhist temple. If, if this is what you're talking about. So this is, this is later. This is not Kamakura. That actually is not about the spread of it, but that's what made it cohere. That's why Buddhism coming into the modern period, every single Buddhist family, whether they know it or not, is a registered member of a temple, right? When a funeral is done, and this was done to break these local cults. It was also done as a form of census taking, right? They basically used the Buddhist organization to, to monitor um, the, the population. So the standard thing you hear now, when, when a, most Japanese will know that their families are Buddhist, but they won't know what sect their temple is. They might learn it when there's a funeral done. They'll show up at the temple and they'll go, by the way, this is a Pure Land, or this is Zen, or whatever. They are completely clueless about this. But that doesn't mean that they don't worship all the time. But they don't necessarily worship in their family temple or you know they'll go when, when they're going to get married they'll go to a temple that specializes in marriage benefits and do a little offering there yeah I, I'm, at, I'm okay. actually can, yeah. hopefully maybe you can hang around for a minute and sure. answer Phoebe's question okay, okay. so I, I, thank you obviously we could go on for another two hours <laughs> thank you